Any form of mental disorder in which the individual's contact with reality becomes distorted is labelled psychosis. Reality is defined in the dictionary as the state of things as they are or appear to be rather than as one might wish them to be. However, what we think of as reality is limited by our cultural and personal beliefs and varies across the world and over time. Psychiatry treats mental illness with medication, aiming to bring people back to a perceived sense of normality. How do you see reality? <laughs> it's, uh, I don't know, a pretty, pretty profound question to start off with, isn't it? How does anyone see reality? But, um, well, according to Buddhist understanding, um, no one actually sees the true nature of reality. Uh, our minds, because of certain delusions in our mind, obscures the actual reality uh, that, you know, that exists, because it's exists in nature. You know, simple examples such as like food, which is you know, an easy example to understand. Some foods we love, some foods we hate. We think the food I hate is really disgusting from the side of the food. It's something that is horrible. If that were true, then everyone would have that same experience, but they don't. They have completely different experiences. So you're going to say, well, what's actually there? Is there anything that is there? And if you start to investigate, you actually can't find anything at all because it just is an appearance to mind, just, like, just as in a dream. Hmm, all this thinking about food is making me hungry. So what is the connection between what we eat and how we experience reality? Well, I think there's um, a very obvious connection. People always say you are what you eat, but it really is true that all the food that you eat actually goes into making bits of your body and getting your body to work. So the foods that we eat, as far as they relate to the brain, some foods we eat actually make the structure of the brain, like um, things that you find in essential fatty acids. These are actually the structure of the brain, things like almonds and sunflower seeds, pumpkin seeds. They actually provide nutrients that make the structure of the brain, while other nutrients that you find, like in vegetables or in proteins, these actually are the neurotransmitters, which are the brain's messages. So by having all the different types of food, you actually can give your body the nutrients it needs to make all the different parts of the brain, as well as the different chemicals that send messages all around your brain into your body. So just like you need calcium to build bones, you need these kinds of foods for your brain to work properly. I specialize in the area of mental health, and I would say a vast majority of my clients, 50, over 50%, have some type of schizophrenia or some psychotic type of illness. The rest are um, suffer from depression, manic depression, obsessive compulsive disorders, and all these different types of mental health problems can be caused by a variety of factors that can be manipulated through nutrition. 
I wonder how many of us keep the right balance of nutrients to ensure optimum mental health. The average diet is deficient in really important nutrients for the, for the brain. Um, one of the key nutrients for the brain is actually zinc. And um, any survey done on people's diets is notoriously low in zinc. And the kind of places you find zinc are things like pumpkin seeds or oysters. And how many people eat much of this? So these are, pumpkin seeds are really important for eating in order to have enough zinc for your brain. Okay, zinc is particularly associated with depression. Okay. Fancy a nut? Under the 1983 Mental Health Act, people can be detained and medicated against their will. This is known as being sectioned and can only be enforced in the interest of the patient's own health or safety or with a view to the protection of other people. Contrary to popular belief, most psychotic people are not violent. According to government statistics, you are 13 times more likely to be killed by a sane person you've never met before than by someone with a mental health diagnosis. Despite this, the government wants to bring in new laws to increase compulsory detention and introduce forced medical treatment in the community. Under the current Act, a person can only be forced to take medication whilst in hospital. Under the proposed reforms, anyone who refuses whilst in the community can be forcibly medicated. People's human rights are violated every day in these hospitals mm. all the time and um, they go unrecognised. Um, and the things on the back of the t-shirt express very clearly what happens to someone once they've linked in with the mental health system as it stands. A lot of discrimination, contr social control, mind control. And through experience I've realised that there is really no care and treatment of mental health as such that, that is beneficial. Most of it is locking people up on wards and diagnosing them with a mental illness and then feeding them drugs and injecting drugs and then they come out back into the community but, but maybe worse off than they were at the start. We are demanding the right to be listened to. We're reclaiming our own voices. We have witnessed and experienced injustice in psychiatry. We're demanding the right to have choice about our lives. We are the public. The kind of medical model pigeonholes people. You know, people don't see the person, they see this diagnosis. So, I mean, I got a diagnosis. I was given the diagnosis of schizophrenia. So people stopped seeing Rufus. They started seeing schizophrenia, you know. Um, you know, I think, you know, all diagnoses of schizophrenia are misdiagnoses. You know, I think that the diagnostic system isn't useful. It's only useful for professionals to categorise people. Coming off the medication, you go through a kind of withdrawal psychosis or mania. And, um, but they'll say, oh, it's the illness coming back, you need to be back on your medication. In actual fact, it's more complicated than that. And it's about your body trying to get used to not being on the drugs again. And it's like, it's like coming up after being suppressed. So you go through this sort of mania. And I was lucky that I was with uh, friends and they didn't panic and uh, call the doctors out. So I was allowed to just go out walking late at night and um, wake friends up and tell them crazy ideas. And people didn't catastrophize it into saying, you're you've lost it and you need to be back in hospital. I've been a psychiatric patient and I am now working in the system. I'm a clinical psychologist. So I've been on both sides and um, I've been forced to take medication that I didn't want to take. So I think we can use compulsion a lot less. I've found, I've been on the wards and been able to negotiate with people. You know, I've given them I've done three things with them, given them feedback about how they're coming across, given uh, them different, a range of options about how to control their moods and, and what's going on for them, and taken their concerns seriously and acted on them. And if you do those three things, I think you, you reduce the need for compulsion uh, significantly. 
I've been sectioned and labelled psychotic. When I was in that state, I felt a profound feeling of connection with everything, that I could communicate telepathically with others and felt my boundaries dissolve. What you're describing, it almost seems to be like, uh, like you know, it's like, as you say, it's like an ego loss, isn't it, really? You just, you just lose that boundary between self and other. Um, and that's precisely what we're trying to do within, within Buddhist meditation, but, you know, because we're doing it on a very gradual basis and, uh, you know, very, um, I don't know, say, controlled environments, um, uh, that, you know, we, that's what, it's finally, that's what we want to begin to experience completely. Searching for more information on the connection between psychosis and spirituality, I came across the Schizophrenia and Shamanism website. Intrigued, I went to go and find out why it was set up. What were the experiences that led you to set up this website? All right, well, I'd, I'd gone psychotic myself and been sectioned, gone through all of that, uh, put on medication very much against my will. And then I'd gradually wean myself off the medication and a few months later I went psychotic again. I didn't want to end up in hospital again, so I actually ran away and found the space and the time to really build up some techniques that helped me to cope with the psychosis and ultimately to get through it and back to ordinary reality. And I felt that I really wanted to set up the website to give that information to people that might want it so that if they w were in a similar position they'd be able to perhaps try these techniques and maybe they might work for them. What is shamanism? It's a way of moving in between different realities, generally with the purpose of causing change in ordinary reality, um, mostly for healing, really, historically. Whenever the apprentice shaman has come in touch with, if you like, Western medicine, They've always been diagnosed as being schizophrenic and stuck onto antipsychotic medication. Antipsychotic medication is used by psychiatrists in an attempt to shut people down. It has been described as chemical lobotomy and its use can lead to depression and even brain damage. Haloperidol, a drug I've been forced to take whilst in hospital, was used by the Soviet Union on political dissidents to induce a state of apathy. The drug was administered in a drink of water given at the start of each day's exercise. The British government experimented on the military using mind-altering drugs to manipulate their reality. This footage shows what happened when soldiers were given LSD. Fifty minutes after taking the drug, radio communication had become difficult, if not impossible, but the men are still capable of sustained physical effort. However, constructive action was still attempted by those retaining a sense of responsibility in spite of physical symptoms. But one hour and ten minutes after taking the drug, with one man climbing a tree to feed the birds, the troop commander gave up, admitting that he could no longer control himself or his men. He himself then relapsed into laughter. So why are some drugs legal and others illegal? I suppose perhaps ultimately it's maybe for control of the populace. Perhaps that's why an awful lot of drugs are made illegal. Because however many deaths there might be every year to psychedelic drugs, and I'd be surprised if it's any to be honest, there are thousands more on account of alcohol. So it can't be that they're trying to protect us from ourselves. So perhaps they just want control over us. They want us. They want to control the way that we think, and the way that we feel, what our values are. What are you doing, Mel? I've lost my mind, but I found this book. <laughs> the editor of this book uses the term transliminal to encompass both psychosis and spiritual experience. She believes that reality can be divided into two states, the ordinary everyday and the transliminal. When you go 
into the transliminal, uh, it's a place where the, are the, uh, you lose the bit of the mind that, that, that chops things up, that discriminates, that, that, that makes the boundaries, which is really useful for everyday life. And without that, it's, it, it feels wonderful. It feels liberating and, and amazing. But not to be too led astray by it. The, 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 the ordinary world is still the one that we got to operate in. It's still vitally important. You know, um, people who, who want to throw the ordinary world over for this sort of super reality, um, that, that's dangerous, that's, that's not helpful. So I would say to, to learn to navigate between the worlds, to learn to navigate between the realities, to, to honour both, and to become aware when things are getting dangerous. If I meet somebody who has had some experiences which are obviously in, uh, spiritual experiences that are really important to them, but which then led on to you know, unpleasant persecutory experiences, um, I, I'm probably one, about the first person who will validate the good experiences and say, yes, that is important, and yes, that's um, you know, in line with the, the, the great spiritual traditions. And I think that's quite important for people because things that have been really meaningful in their lives, I think there's a bit of a danger that the, the medical system sort of rubbishes it by, by saying, well, that's just part of your illness. So um, the first thing I do is to, to try and un undo some of that damage. And I usually negotiate a language with people. Concepts like shared reality and non-shared reality I find helpful. People can usually realise that when they're um, operating from something that medically would be called a delusional system, um, though they themselves are very convinced about it, they do recognise that not everybody else sees it in the same way. So, how can I prepare myself for travelling in other dimensions? To be in touch with other people who are interested in this sort of thing, um, a, a, a spiritual tradition is, is helpful for this. Um, I would go for a sort of groundedish spiritual tradition. Doesn't matter which one, but you know, I, th I think that that can be helpful. Um, I think where you n you know that you've got a danger of going too far into the transliminal and getting lost there and that sort of thing. I think to to note down the danger signs for yourself to have a list of them and maybe think how many, um, you know, if there's, say, say you did a list of ten signs of what tends to happen when things start to go, go pear-shaped, um, think how many have to be in place before you really do need to start to take action to shut yourself down rather than get yourself shut down officially. One thing that I used to do is stick up messages here and there saying, do you feel in a particular, are you feeling a particular thing? Well, guess what, you know, maybe this has happened. And that can be enough to shock me into realising that I have actually gone psychotic, if you like. I have started experiencing that. And then, as well as those, those uh, stickers saying, you know, are, are you feeling this way? Are you experiencing this? I'd have other ones saying, well, what, how about trying a bit of this? so that even if I'd completely forgotten my methods of coping, I've got them stuck up all around the house, so that just to remind me of what it is I need to do to get through it. Best thing you can do, first of all, is get rid of the general chit-chat in your mind. Meditation, or again, something repetitive like drumming, and just gradually build it up from there, and you'll find your way. The thing that works the best for me is drumming, uh, repetitive drumming on hand drums. The reason I thought of it was just through reading about shamanism and seeing the ways that they cope with it and trying them out myself. And it doesn't even have to be on hand drums actually, you can just do it on your legs, uh, but you have to get completely into it and just let yourself go with it. It totally stops the voices in your head. Um, and by that I don't just mean from disembodied beings that people that are allegedly schizophrenic tend to hear. 
I also mean the general chit chat that you get in your mind, the internal chatter, if you like, that everyone experiences. You know, if you just stop talking for a minute, then there it is, it's going. And drumming stops that. And so it frees you from that and it enables you to move further. You're no longer stuck in, in that place. You can go somewhere else. And where you choose, where you then go to is sometimes a matter of choice. Sometimes you get taken there, but um, at least then you're moving, you're progressing. Just remember folks, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. In my experience, maintaining an even blood sugar balance is the best way of trying to maintain an even mental health throughout the day. So what is blood sugar? Circulating in the blood, we've got between one and two teaspoons of sugar. This feeds the brain, gives the body energy, it just maintains everything and the body's really boring and it wants that sugar level to be nice and even throughout the day. Now the way we eat is we eat something in the morning, a sugary cereal, we have a cup of tea with sugar or a biscuit and the amount of sugar in the blood shoots up very, very quickly. This causes the body to actually panic and the body inserts insulin, releases insulin, so that it brings the blood sugar level down. But when it does, it drops it too low. And this is when people get that mid-morning slump, that feeling lack of concentration. People feel irritable, ratty, really depressed, and then they reach for the chocolate bar. This is what I need to bring it up. And the right, a chocolate bar will bring it up, but it'll bring it up too high again and then up it goes, the body again has to overreact and it says, stop, stop, there's too much sugar. It readjusts to bring it down again and then we feel really tired. In addition, most psychotic medication also has this impact on blood sugar of, of causing it to fluctuate. So by eating, you know, sugary foods, it only compounds the side effects of the medication. What are the ways that we can maintain our blood sugar? Okay, first of all, let's look at the bad foods. Even coffee and tea, even without sugar, can cause blood sugar levels to rise. And of course, sweets, chocolates, donuts, biscuits, all these things are things to be avoided. Alternatives to things like coffee and tea are herbal teas. Probably the, the most important thing to do in balancing blood sugar is snack throughout the day but we're not talking about eating lots of biscuits throughout the day. It's gotta be special foods and we really wanna combine protein and carbohydrate a little bit every day. Start the day with a bowl of cereal. A low sugar cereal is the best and you can always tell that by looking on the edge and when you look on the side, just look at the nutritional information, look at how much sugar there is. Compare all the different cereals and try to find the one with the lowest amount of sugar and don't add any. So some cereal and add a bit of protein by adding some seeds. These are sunflower seeds. They have a few, they have protein in it. When you put a handful of that on the cereal in the morning, that'll give you a good start to the day. No matter what time you wake up, it's good to start with something like that. Then get ready to have different snacks throughout the day. If you're going to go out, bring an apple and maybe put a few almonds in a bag. Here you have some carbohydrate again and then you have your protein in the form of some almonds. You don't need to eat a lot of food, but every two hours just eating a little bit like that throughout the day makes a tremendous, absolutely tremendous difference. When I'm in a psychotic state, I realize just how magical, mystical and meaningful life really is. However, this feeling of openness can leave one feeling vulnerable. Now that sense that, that the person is under threat might be real or it might, might not. It might be something out of the memory or, or, or something. And 
the state of high arousal doesn't help the person to sort out whether it's real or not because in such a state uh, the mind goes into tunnel vision and people are only really looking for threat so you can get into a vicious circle there so switching that off is really important and a very simple way to do it um, when your body's getting ready for action you breathe in more than you breathe out which is what you need to do if you're going to do something very active so see to it that you breathe out more than you breathe in long slow out breaths relaxing on the out breath and I teach that to people it's very simple gardening is a really good way of grounding as you are literally earthed if you haven't got a garden allotments can be rented very cheaply from your local council or you can simply sow seeds in a flower pot or window box and watch them grow. Not sleeping is a sign. You know, things are getting, getting out of control very often for very many people. So that where somebody can't sleep and things are racing, and uh, I, I would suggest not getting too hung up on sleep, but being really keen on rest and even if it's boring and there's you know you could be out there changing the world put on some chill music and just you know rest through the night even if you're not going to sleep if you're feeling tense and agitated massage can be very helpful some people also find aromatherapy acupuncture and herbal medicine to be of great benefit go for long walks not in any particular direction, but just where you feel like going at the time. If you're in a city, try and get out to the country and just walk and walk and notice everything on your path. Try and get rid of the general chit chat in your head and don't blame yourself for everything. You're doing the best that you can. As well as being good for you, some food can even send certain people mad. Another really important factor for a lot of people with mental health problems, and this is in particular for psychotic um, kinds of conditions as well as depression, are food allergies and food intolerances. There's a um, professor at the University of Sheffield, uh, uh, Professor Haja Vasiliou, and he has found in his depression clinic that 60% of the people coming in with depression actually have an intolerance to wheat. So it's actually food allergies can also cause problems. Can you tell me what the difference is between an allergy and an intolerance? Oh, that's a, it's a good question. So you probably are familiar with people with a peanut allergy. Within seconds of just breathing in a peanut oil in a restaurant or eating a peanut, they're being rushed to hospital. The reaction is very immediate and very severe. Whereas in intolerances, the reaction can take a couple of days and it can manifest in a variety of ways. Sometimes people actually get a bit of skin problem, eczema from it or digestive problems or they feel very sleepy or feel very depressed the next day or they can have a combination of these so if a person has any kind of bloating or skin problems as well as having a mental health problem then they really should look into whether or not they have a food intolerance and um, what are the common foods that people are intolerant to? Uh, probably the two key foods that I encounter are reactions to dairy products and to wheat products and these are common everyday foods so it's quite interesting that these are the foods that people have a problem with. Wheat is actually found in cereal, bread, pasta, biscuits, croissants, baguettes, those types of foods, pizza. And dairy foods are things like milk, cheese, butter. 
I had one client who his psychotic episodes were actually brought on by dairy foods. And it was interesting because when he was seven years old, a doctor actually said to him, you have a dairy intolerance. But no one actually paid much attention to this. And when he was uh, sort of 17, 18, he started experiencing lots of um, psychotic episodes and was diagnosed with schizophrenia. When he came to see me, I suggested that he stop all dairy products completely and he found he didn't have any psychotic episodes until two years later when he happened to have a croissant that had a bit of butter in it and all of a sudden all the psychosis came back. Psychiatry uses medication to mask symptoms caused by irregularities in brain chemistry. However, these biochemical imbalances can also be adjusted using nutritional therapy. And in, in order to do this, really you need the guidance of a nutrition consultant who is actually trained in this area. Because we can test through blood and urine specific imbalances in histamine levels, in vitamin levels, in um, various other mechanisms in the body that for some reason through a genetic predisposition cause an imbalance. In a lot of cultures around the world people go into trances, get possessed by spirits, um, hear their ancestors talking to them and that's considered completely normal right. part of life of their society. Why do you think it's um, why do you think in our society it's, it's not acceptable or normal? I think historically it's probably because of Christianity and the way that they took over from all the folk beliefs. I'm not saying Christians are bad or anything like that, but historically Christianity did take over from the older goddess worshipping religions that were here beforehand and we've all heard about the persecution of witches. It's only very recently that witchcraft has stopped being an actual crime. Lots of people hear voices, some pleasant, some unpleasant. In our society it's considered acceptable to talk to God. But what if God talks back? And a lot of people that I see have never had a nice experience at all. They just have horrible, abusive voices and things like that. That very often is a rerun of abusive experience, but very often it, it, that, that trauma, and that, and that's what I would call a trauma-based psychosis, that people have had very traumatic things happen to them early on. They've put themselves back together again, sort of picked up and gone and made their world, but then somehow the mind cracks along the fault line and, and all this stuff comes out again. And if it comes out in a psychotic form rather than in a sort of neurotic form, then it's that bit more difficult to deal with because it feels as if it's a voice happening now rather than a, a memory or a flashback or something. So it's, it's, it's more and also because of this sort of supernatural gloss that everything in the transliminal gets, maybe the voice is that of the devil rather than of the abuser or something. Um, I'm mixed race and when I was um, about 21 I started hearing these terrifying voices that were very racist and, um, and uh, which made me at the time kind of think oh my god I must be really evil like you know I'm really racist and I'm really um, you know and you know kind of these voices sort of telling me to hate certain people like walking down the street if they were a different colour to me or if you know or even if they were the same colour to me you know and, and uh, but yeah then just sort of realised that yeah that you know that's not me that's just what I have to kind of get beyond mm. you know, that's just the stuff that's been put into me like during my childhood or whatever and that's just what I have to get to get beyond or understand. Sure. Yeah. Don't take it personally, first of all. It's not you as a person that the voices are having a go at. It's the you that you have to leave behind in order to move on. And try opening up a channel of communication. Try talking back and maybe explaining that you don't find what the voices are saying to be helpful. and. Presumably that voice is there to help you. Why else would it be hanging around? If it's there for any other reason, just get rid of it. Ask it to leave or ask it to stay and help. I would say that perhaps rather than trying to shut things out of your mind, if you really focus on them, if you've got a particular being that you're seeing all the time, rather than trying to run away from it, stop and draw it, totally immerse yourself in it and try and recreate it there and once it's on the page 
then it's not so frightening. And to remember places that you've been in other realities, very often poetry is a really good way to remember the state of mind that you had when, when you wrote that, rather than writing a factual diary. Poetry can be a really good way to remember these places and visit them again very often. So what are three things that I could do to, to improve my mental health? Okay, I'd say three most important things. Number one, get rid of all sugar and stimulants and coffee and tea. Get that out of the diet. Number two, have lots of variety of fruit, vegetables, nuts and seeds. And number three, take a good multivitamin. The best way, if you've been psychotic before, and you're a bit scared of going that way again, but you still want to explore those realities, is to do it gradually and gently. <laughs> <laughs> and how, how would you do that? By, personally I would do it by drumming repetitively on hand drums, and I mean for a period of a number of hours really. Quite often, me and some friends, we go up the woods and we do it there either on drums or just on a tabletop there. And if you keep your paths to those other worlds open, then they don't all build up and have to force themselves on you. Are there shamans in this country? There are. Uh, it's, it's, it's not the kind of thing that's actually... There, are, there aren't like recognised shamans in the way that you have recognised osteopaths or something like that. So anyone can call themselves a shaman even if really they're not, so you do have to be aware of that. Uh, so it probably is well worth contacting people if you know of one locally and kind of judge for yourself whether or not they can help you. But having said that, there are characters that you'll meet in other realities that will help you through. You don't need to be apprenticed to a physical shaman in order to learn the techniques and things to get through this. Uh, dream beings, beings from other realities will come and help you through. When, when we're under the influence of like a heavy black cloud, deep depression or you say psychosis, um, it's, it's try not to identify with that. Try to think, this is me. Because that's the problem, we think, you know, oh, I'm, you know, I've gone mad. I, I can't, you know, I can't go. But it's just the kind of thing where it's just an appearance to mind. Meditation is often recommended as a way to calm and control one's mind. But just how do you meditate? Uh, a very simple breathing meditation. So you just try to kind of sit comfortably any way you can. Uh, most, you know, you don't have to sit cross-legged or anything like that and sit on a chair <laughs> just be comfortable close your eyes gently and then we just try to locate the sensation of each breath as you can feel it within the nostrils so it's quite a subtle physical sensation and again just breathing gently and normally you're not trying to control the breath in any way at all um, and then just simply focus on that and what you will find is that immediately you can't hold on to it. The mind just starts moving off somewhere else. Another thought comes up and you get distracted. But that's okay, you just bring the focus back onto the breath again. Hold it, you get distracted again, just keep on bringing it back. It's that bringing it back that's actually developing uh, concentration. Once you know, the mind stops going, then you just simply hold the mind on the breath, the concentration on the breath. And, and again, you just, you just pay no attention to what's going on in the rest of your mind. And what you will find is gradually that those thoughts and feelings and turbulence just begin to die down. And you're left with a, a feeling of, of extraordinary spaciousness in the mind. And to, to begin with, concentration is not good. But we find that you know, it's like a mental muscle that has been used for very long. So every time you, you bring it back to its object, you, you're exercising that muscle. So, and if we try to do just that simple technique and try to do maybe for 10, 15 minutes every day for, for a week, you find that 
and she improved beyond recognition. It's not too difficult. The way we experience the world around us is often limited by our social, religious, economic and political constructs. So who is responsible for defining our reality? I think we all have a responsibility to define reality. I mean, OK, you know, the powerful people in the media and what have you try, but um, I was in London on the 15th of February, you know, I think there was uh, a million, two million of us trying to define our reality then. Today, millions of people across the world are saying no to war, no to the war that Mr. Bush is asking. Throughout history, humans have always sought to explore and alter reality. Such efforts are actively suppressed in our society, notably by banning psychedelic drugs and institutionalising mystics. However, we are still evolving. I hope that the future is one whereby we become more and more supportive of each other and those of us that have found the way through are there to help people that are still trying to find their way through. Passing on techniques, advice, information, just being there. So what would you say is the purpose of being human? I think it's a, I think it's a tightrope act. I think it's a balancing act. I think it's the, the rich diversity of being human and, and the possibility. I think you, you touched on it, you know, um, our power to define reality, to define to, you know, it, what each one of us can do is, is limited, it's small, but we never know what the, you know, what repercussions it will have. We never know what effect just our being has on other people and on I think we operate in a, in a web of, of, of connection, a web of being. I think that's more important than, you know, amazing things that the individual does. I see us as, as connected beings. I've been sectioned and labelled psychotic. When I was in that state, I felt, I felt, I've been sectioned and labelled psychotic. <laughs> I've been sectioned and labelled psychotic, believe it or not. I pledge defiance to the flag of the United Snakes of Captivity. One nation under God or else. One nation under psychopathic Pentagon gangsters whose idea of national security is concentration camps for people who dare to use the drugs that the CIA brings in and the government supplies themselves. I've been <laughs> Don't look at me. I've been sectioned and labelled psychotic. When I was in that state. Me, two, three, four, five, six, sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never. I might be psychotic, or even a Paki, a Carib, an Arab, a Gypsy Rose Lee. I think I know who I want to be, a masala of surprises, a free-floating dream, because things are never quite what they seem. Rainbow of possibilities, moon and the sun, skipping between worlds, a goddess having fun. I'm a zebra, a panda, a piebald pony, if you speak to me softly, my name means honey. I'm a many petal dog rose, I'm a lotus on the water, a child of the universe and a total nutter. Me, too, walking between worlds. Me, one.